to the, the current state mm -hmm. of things, the, the madness as things are coming together. Um, we're right at that point where we're beginning, as we're starting to look at the, the incorporation of nonprofit status and such, where we really need to figure out, uh, you know, the, the name, the brand, the mission, the vision, all of those pieces so that we're able to set up not just for the immediate, but for looking at what we're moving forward through. Um, and Arthur, the reason that, uh, that I suggested, you know, if, if Amy can, can give us the time, it would be amazing to talk to her. Um, Amy works with a bunch of different nonprofits, some of the ones that we've been talking about as potential uh, models with Tay in terms of how they do things. Um, so Salvation Army, a whole bunch of different ones Amy has worked with. Um, and, and what she's really great at is talking to an organization, figuring out what they're about, um, and then figuring out, okay, how do you actually communicate the heart of what it is that you're doing in a way that, that engages and is, and is comprehensible? I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Amy explain it from there. And quick, <laughs> quick thing, I really apologize, but I'll be eating. <laughs> I just don't have any time. No worries. Um, yeah, so I, like Daniel said, work with lots of nonprofits and charities, and oftentimes I will meet with them and say, so tell me about your organization. And they'll start by telling me all the things that they do. Like, oh, we served this many meals to the homeless, or we protected this many acres of land this year. Um, but what we want to get to is the why. So uh, Simon um, Sinek, uh, yeah. people buy why you do it, not what you do it. Mm -hmm. I get it. Yeah. yeah, because most times, while there are a certain segment of people who do really get excited about, oh, that's 30% more meals than last year, you know, we're really growing the program or something. Um, really, the reason people give is for the why. Um, the reason people get excited about things is about the impact that they can have by supporting an organization. So why don't we start by um, you telling me a little bit about the why and if you see this continuing not just related to COVID, um, how that why exists and what that looks like as well. Yeah, so let me share a quick PDF with you. The one that actually one of the guys that joined us uh, and has been in, in the Slack for, for like 24 hours, he created this visualization just to make sense out of uh, what he's seeing. And basically, first try is like, why are we here? Obviously to respond to Accord 19 Kaggle Challenge and help medical professionals answer questions. This is where Kaggle comes in. Mm -hmm but it's not really why we're here. Kaggle brought us together, but we're really ha here to help the global fight against COVID-19. And I don't think we should stop there. We knew something like this would happen and we know something like this will happen again. So kind of future mm -hmm. outbreaks. And then, so why limit it to just outbreaks? If we plan ahead, we can make a permanent change to the medical and health community at large. So this is kind of the, the, the high level picture of why. Does it answer your, your question? So it gets to part of it, but why do you want to do that? Why do you want to make a change to the medical and health community? Why do you want to help prevent future outbreaks? What is the, what is the impact in human terms? Yeah, so the current pandemic is really the byproduct of the current system. And it, it, it is this, kind of the, you know, we are so used in our society to treat all of these diseases and uh, phenomena as something that lives somewhere there. It doesn't touch us individually. And now with coronavirus as phenomenon, uh, it kind of showed us that, hey, like I'm a common thread. I exist and I may as well kill you all if you don't do something, if you don't change. And that's basically the why. There's so many of these common enemies out there and we're just ignoring them because of how the current society works, how the current system works, and how, you know, particularly medicine and health care is so like detached from the actual, um, you know, goals of us as humanity. Do you mind if I throw in a couple of, of observations of what's been gelling? Um, I think <coughs> one, one piece of the why also is that we're at this really interesting uh, kind of confluence where, the, um, 
what can be done through artificial intelligence is pretty powerful and inter interesting. Um, the degree to which that's gotten harnessed in an open source kind of way, um, direct, directed towards positive social impact, um, is is maybe more minimal. There's been some stuff that's done with that, but it feels like there's this amazing need that's there and that societally we're at this place right now where we're just, we're awash in useful data, but there's so much of it and it's so badly structured often that we don't actually make much use of it. We don't, we don't do the things we could be doing with it. And it feels like part of the why here is that it's an opportunity. When I was talking to folks yesterday, it was kind of like, it's almost like the artificial intelligence Peace Corps. This is an opportunity for people who want to kind of dig in and be making some of that change through data analysis and artificial intelligence to, to be able to, to find the big causes where that can be done and to get organized with other people doing it um, and, and then to have a, a measurable impact. Yeah, I like that the artificial intelligence Peace Corps, you get the sense of you know, the volunteer aspect and the, um, yeah, people doing their part, that sort of altruism that is sort of in there as well. Um, yeah, I think too, it's interesting you say that society is awash in data, but we're not making good use of it in so many ways. And my background is corporate marketing. So you know, I switched to the nonprofit side years ago after uh, wanting to make a change there. But the one place that, you know, big international organizations are making use of our data is to sell us more stuff. And so I think it's true that for most people, they don't see data analysis as a good thing. They see it as people learning too much about them and using it to alter their Facebook feed with weird ads that, you know, because they mentioned, you know, tires one day, suddenly all of the tires are coming up. Yeah, so I think that's interesting. Um, and yeah, the positive impact for humanity and open source and all that good stuff. Um, Anton, uh, if you're there still, did you want to add anything from your perspective? Uh yeah, sure. I have a kind of few analogies that uh, yesterday we have a nice call and I started thinking about this analogy with the nonprofit for providing like food for people in need, right? Mm -hmm. I think we're slightly different. Uh, so with this analogy that our ingredients are like data, right? And we have, so essentially what we do, we take raw data that is just out in the wild. Now we go through our like process where people donate their time and we essentially pre prepare like a, like a healthy food for others to use later, right? So in a sense, in terms of like what we do and like why we're doing is like, okay, we see that there are so much misinformation. There is so much overconsumption mm -hmm. of data. Kind of goes back to, to your point about this corporate, like corporations do the surveillance data age they collect everything about you and then feed you with this like fast food type of data, mm -hmm. right? So in a sense, what we're trying to do, like, okay, we, we can't attack every, any, like everything in terms of like data consumption. But what we could do is at least as far as, for example, right now, coronavirus, we collect the data, we validated it, right? Create something out of it ready for consumption by professionals. Maybe we'll do something that like regular people will be able to see. Right, but the idea is like, okay, we're, at least we're creating like the good food, good mm. recipes, how, things like this. Again, kind of like my more of a like technical, mechanical kind of understanding of what, what, what we see here. Hopefully it will give, give an idea what, like why mm. we're doing this. Yeah. yeah, no, I like that. It's sort of the healthy alternative of, um, all the big data stuff going on in the background um, as opposed to, yeah, the consumerist side of things. Okay, um, so I noticed in the slide deck you had, Arthur, that you had it focused on not just pandemics, but other sort of medical needs. Is that your overarching desire is to stay in the medical field or 
would it go to climate change or would it go to other big problems in the world? So here, like to give you a quick answer, I think we have to, you know, bite only things that we can uh, chew in the, the most uh, immediate kind of, uh, I would say even years. But overall, I am uh, thinking about a more like high level uh, radical innovation that will touch all the possible uh, angles of our society. So, and I, I used to have this idea of creating this um, radical entity that would solve all of the tough problems of the world. And I even have the spreadsheet that I've prepared before the coronavirus hit everything. And it basically has like addiction, aging, consumerism, healthcare, environment, immigration, food, business, governance, security, education, mental health, basically everything that mm -hmm. you can possibly imagine and all the possible issues like racism, hatred, uh, household debt, disinformation, energy. And, you know, the, all of these common enemies exist out there. And I, I am thinking about Corona Y as that, you know, medical um, aspect of it. I think that it will be almost impossible at the current stage with all the current craziness that we have to try and, you know, um, hit the, the higher level, the umbrella uh, vision that, that I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so right now, are you searching for a name and a brand that is specific to what is now called Corona Y? Or do you want something that will last and be sort of the umbrella that will go to the bigger picture, the bigger scale? Or are you really wanting something right now that will just sort of suit this need? I would say right now to suit the need. And obviously we don't know for how long uh, this will be going mm -hmm. on. Like it's definitely, you know, at least a couple more months. And if that's the case, the second and third order consequences will be basically, you know, insane in terms of all the spill spillover of the, mm -hmm. the issues. So I do think that we need something for right now. And who knows, maybe, you know, three months from now or six months from now or a year from now, there's going to be a need for spin-offs and, you know, maybe going, you know, uh, horizontal or vertical to, to create new type of entities. Mm -hmm. one, if it's all right, I'll, I'll do my, my one trick pony devil's advocation that I think that if, if we frame our mission around, um, I, I sort of threw this into the, my mission attempt, I'll just quickly read, read that part. So like Corona Wise mission is to mobilize volunteers and community partners to create, validate, and curate data, software, and findings to help the public, policymakers, and medical community improve global health and well-being. If we go at that global health and well-being kind of an angle, it makes it really easy for us to focus on medicine. And for that, like that's right at the bullseye of it. But it means that later if we say, well, like, you know, looking at poverty is also a piece of, of global well-being, we can't without it, it, it having to reformulate the mission. But one of the reasons why I think doing some of it now is because this is like right now with COVID-19, this is our generation's polio. This is, the this is the time when our whole world population is, is waking up to the, the dangers of something like a, like a real pandemic like this in a way that we've been pretty naive about up until now. And if we're able to step in and do something that's relevant and important during that, there's a whole set of association and connotation that builds around whatever we call ourselves. And so if we then have to rebrand um, for that larger piece, it, makes, it might make it harder to, re, to rebuild that set of connotations around it, rather than to start out square in the middle of medicine, um, but with a mission that allows us to glide in a different direction as needed. But so, anyways, mm -hmm. my bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, no, some things are percolating for sure. And so in terms of AI, in terms of the artificial intelligence side, is that the central piece of everything or is it more mobilizing the people who have all sorts of different skills to attack a big problem in the world and be you know, gung-ho to do it, to look it in the eye and do stuff? Or is it purely just about 
the data, but then having some side, like the administration almost of the people doing the data. So your marketing people and your, your coordinator people and, um, you know, the medical professionals to sort of fact check things from their best knowledge. Yeah, I think um, we're way beyond the just tech geek squad at this point. Mm -hmm. My, my hunch is that also as, as, as we develop right now, it's people who have that NLP and BERT and all the AI knowledge who are at the core of, of that piece of it. But as we keep on developing the tools and the source and the software that we're doing, I think we're going to be able to make it easier and easier for a wider range of people to meaningfully contribute to, to that piece as well. So, you know, building ontologies and actually bringing in the data. Um, so we're not there yet, but my hunch is that that's going to become something that expands as well. I don't know what what your thought on that instruction. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And um, so just to go back a second to the timeline of things, I know Anton, you said, or Arthur, you said you don't know, could be a few months, might be longer. I know our prime minister just yesterday in his daily press conference said, you know, until there's a vaccine, realistically, we can't go back to our total normal, um, which he's sort of predicting right now, 18 to 24 months is what he was sort of, that's the first time he's set a timeline that big. Um, it took a lot of people by surprise. Um, are you seeing this be sort of an ongoing thing in the same speed and it has been right now or after the Kegel challenge is done, will that change a bit or how are sort my of assumption is in place in terms of time commitments? Yeah, my right. assumption is that it'll, it'll go away faster if we do things right. And basically it will uh, extend to us being this launch pad for other teams to build ideas. And it's already happening. Like that call that uh, Daniel organized with Wout and Sander with building the open data project for individuals to be able to control their data and share it with uh, research institutions or anyone. I think we become this kind of launch pad which launches rockets into the space and you know helps them with infrastructure engineers uh, fuel and basically overcoming that gravity uh, which is the external world into which you're launching these uh, exciting ideas mm -hmm. um, quick heads up uh, i i was going to have the meeting with pr firm that proposed the pro bono work in three minutes it was it used to be a, a call but i'm sending them the link to the zoom so hopefully we can use this one mm -hmm. yeah and i'll um i'll take back everything you said my process is always to just sort of think on things let some stuff come up check in around like does this sound right does that sound right um so i can hop off this call for sure now if you like um, actually i would if, prefer you to stay if you can, because oh, sure. uh, one of the key, you know, f functions of PR firm is actually defining that message and, mm -hmm. you know, using that message to resonate with the public. So if you can, please stay. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like the kids are currently well settled upstairs, so <laughs> <laughs> we can uh, all be on calls for <coughs> now. It seems like. Yeah, I I can only imagine. Yes. Well, at least today we don't have to try because it's the Good Friday holiday here. Um, we don't have to try to be getting in some sort of replication of education into them today. So mm. they're happy enough doing their own thing. Yeah. Again, we're we're entering a completely new world where we have to invent things. Like mm -hmm. we, we just are not prepared to deal with it. Okay, so I just sent them the, the link. It might be a good idea for me to give them a call and make sure they got it. So let me...
Uh, if you have any other questions that, uh, you know, okay. we can answer. Great. Multitask. Um, is <laughs> That's there my anything... life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is there anything that we haven't sort of talked about already that you feel like is a really big part of what you're doing and why? In, in respect to which, like, entities or, like... Um, in respect to, you know, the team of volunteers, the international movement almost that this is, um, is there any side piece of that part where that's a major component, I would think, to have this worldwide almost um, input into what you're building? I can I can throw one piece on if you want. Mm -hmm. So when 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 Arthur was talking about the uh, the launch pad um, side of things, one of the things we've been talking a lot about is the way that we are building and becoming more skilled at at that emergent piece of bringing a whole bunch of volunteers together and then being able to structure them into some sort of a functional organism. And there's a couple of different metaphors that have come up a lot. The ant hill idea is one. So sort of developing these emergent patterns like that. Um, and then another another piece that uh, kind of Arthur has talked about is sort of a hammer metaphor. Like we're really good at building a hammer that can then like the, the hammer isn't uh, the, the end goal, but that hammer can then be used. You know, you just have to find a nail to sort of apply it to. Um, so those are I think two pieces there. One one in terms of our ability to bring people together and structure that in a functional way, um, where it's beneficial both for the people um, in, in what they get out of it and for the for the end product, but also our ability to then pivot pretty gracefully, bringing in new people, new resources, whatever it may be, to deal with the next crisis or the next piece that might come. Mm -hmm. And why do you think people around the world are interested in devoting hours and hours of their time to this right now? What is it that is exciting to them to be a part of this? That's a good question. Like, I think it's a combination of multiple factors. One of them is because we naturally gravitate towards that. Like we as humans, we love to collaborate, we love to solve complex problems, we love to put our brains to work. And I think that's, you know, natural ability. And the second factor is just us, um, you know, having ability to do that right now with all the, you know, distractions uh, off. Okay, so I think Natalie is joining us. Yes, hi guys, this is Natalie. Hey Natalie. Hey. Hi, and um, my my colleague Lizzie is joining as well. Um, so I sent her the number, and she should be diving in here any second. So uh, Lizzie and I are co-founders. Hi guys, I'm here. Hi everyone. <laughs> hey. Hey. So uh, hi. Again, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you so much for jumping in. I just thought it will be much more productive to have um, core team on on the call here to help me better. You know. Uh, define what we're doing for uh, for you for this initial kickoff session. So I guess I'll I'll start for, with introductions. So uh, Natalie is uh, a professional in PR industry that I got connected through mutual uh, contacts here in LA, and basically she she told me that hey like this is great like I think we can help you and she was willing enough to uh, provide the pro bono contract obviously limited to the realities of the current crisis. And, you know, everyone contributes um, whatever they can in the current climate. But again, we really appreciate uh, your help, Natalie. And um, yeah, like whatever it takes for us to make it easier for you, we, we will do everything possible. So great. Lizzie is, is your partner, right? I'm, I'm sorry. I... Yes, and, and so I know no one on this call has been able to speak to Lizzie, including you, Arthur, so I think it's worth her just taking a minute to say hello, but yes, she's the co-founder of our agency, Fung PR. Amazing. Hi, everyone. Lovely to meet you. Um, my name is Lizzie Spray, um, and as Matthew said, I'm, I, I am a co-founder of Song. Um, I've got about over 10 uh, years of um, PR experience. I'm based here in the Bay Area, um, despite sounding very British, I am originally from England and moved over here um, just over four years ago. Um, but um, I've worked with Natalie for a few years now um, and 
predominantly work in the technology space um, and so very familiar with the areas that you guys are working on and when Natalie was talking about your mission and what you guys are doing I'm just very very excited to be a part of this journey and I think what you're doing is very um, very important and a, and a story that um, needs to be told far and wide so I'm really excited to be on this journey with you guys um, and you know hopefully making some noise about this so thank you for having me um, <laughs> and um, Natalie has um, shared um, notes and background based on your previous conversations um, but um, you know any questions that arise I'll kind of I'll, I'll chime in but um, yeah I can't wait to hear updates on what you guys have been up to and next steps. <laughs> Amazing and yeah like the, the thing is that it's so easy to kind of evangelize what we're doing because it, it, it makes sense and it's amazing. It's simply beautiful. And that's why like it, it takes a little bit of groundwork to explain what we're doing. But once you get it, you're like, oh, wow, like this is amazing. So, yeah, thanks a lot for jumping in. Um, so please meet uh, Daniel uh, Linderberger. Uh, Linderberger. I, I've actually never pronounced his last name. Uh, like this, this is probably the first like more official call that, that we're having together. But Daniel has been uh, one of the first key uh, members of the community. Um, I think he joined when we were like 50 members or, or so. Now we're 900 members and he observed it, it all from the very first day. And he was and he is the main kind of... Um, right hand in, in this kind of mess and chaos and creativity that that is happening. We also have Amy who is wife of Daniel and she's uh, helping us uh, with the messaging and making sure that we're um, you know communicating uh, properly to whoever we, we should be communicating and uh, there is Anton on the call who is also the person uh, that saw this all from the very first day and he was the person he's a more technical person uh, even than I and he was uh, the one that I initially spoke about on the very first day about hey like this is a very important uh, Kaggle challenge and we should be doing something about it and then like he was also helping me to structure this kind of bridge between non-technical people and super super technical people so that's about it. Great. Well, lovely Great. to meet you all. So um, in terms of next steps, um, Artur, I guess maybe let's start by um, talking about the proposal. I mean, certainly we shared with you our thoughts on what we think we can do and how we can start. Um, I know you had a chance to review it, wanted to see if you had any questions. Um, or anything you wanted to bring up before, you know, we actually dive into what's been going on with you guys since we last spoke? No, I think it makes sense. Like, I absolutely love that uh, you have a structure and that's completely different than, you know, I used to work with many PR agencies in, in tech space and it all starts with just, you know, you pay us a retainer and we do something and that something is, is not well defined. And with you guys, I, I'm seeing very, very specific things that will happen, and this is exciting. Well, good. That's great feedback for us. Thank you. Um, we actually approach every new account, whether it's a paid retainer or not, with this level of specificity. So mm -hmm. um, it's nice to hear that, that that's something that stood out to you. So, um, so one of the biggest things that we need to accomplish, and I think, and we talked a little bit about this when we spoke on the phone last week, our tour. Um, that's going to be critical for us is um, being able to tell really strong messaging about what Corona Y is, why it exists, what it's doing. And we know that that messaging has evolved greatly. I mean, last we spoke, I think there were 600 strong. So in a week, you've added another 300 people. So I can only imagine what that means um, from every it's perspective of that. Right. And so it's going to be really important for us to you know, get those collect the collective wisdom of either the people on this call or whoever else you feel are decision makers in this process to determine what the messaging is. Now, the good thing about that is that this can be happening and we can be working on this in tandem with doing some other things too, so that it's not just we're all sitting around waiting until the messaging is completely signed off and we're all happy with it. 
Um, but it is really important and something that we should absolutely do first as part of our very first activities. Um, the other thing that we will want to focus on is um, identifying who the spokespeople are. Um, and this doesn't need to be a lot of people. In fact, it shouldn't be a lot of people, but we should have some very um, specific you know, focuses with the spokespeople. So clearly, Artur, you're the beginning person. You know, this was your idea and it sort of stemmed from you. So you are make obvious sense for being a spokesperson, but there should also be someone um, who can speak, as you said, to maybe some of the more technical aspects, who can be a little bit more, who's well-spoken and um, can com clearly communicate technical aspects to different audiences, but understands it that well. So I don't know if there's somebody that's coming to mind or someone on this call that fits that bill, but that would be helpful um, for press who are more tech-minded and who really want to talk about that detail. Um, and then if there's anyone else, you know, um, it's always nice to have um, a female um, or a, just a non-white male be a spokesperson, if I'm being honest. Um, press appreciate that. Um, so if there's a really strong woman in the organization who's doing a lot of great things or um, multiple, someone actually. else, yeah. I would imagine. That would be my guess. Um, but someone who would be a good spokespeople, so that spokesperson, that's somebody to consider too. Um, and, and there can be, like I said, it doesn't have, you know, I know that when we last spoke, there were four different areas of research you're focused on. Perhaps there's a spokesperson for each of those areas. Again, this may sort of flesh out, but these are questions we want you to be thinking about and determining who makes the most sense. And once we figure out who those people are, we're going to need bios for them so that we have an understanding of what their background is and why they're experts in this area and, you know, so that we can convince the, the press we're talking to that they're worth speaking to and they're a credible resource. Um, headshots are really helpful. They're often asked for. So if those don't exist at all, then we can even just put together some very simple ones. We can give you some feedback on how to make those happen. Um, Lizzie, what else am I thinking, forgetting with spokespeople? Um, I think that's the big thing. I think, that we I need think to one say. of the key things that would be good is, um, and something hopefully we might be able to get from this call is, or, or perhaps after we can send like a standard template of this information that we need from each spokesperson. But it is good to get two or three bullet points from the spokesperson that we can then develop into um, commentary or quotes. So we have that approved content already that we can essentially share with press that they can use um, immediately. Um, and, you know, hopefully with that we can look at securing more, more of those in-depth interviews but it's good just to have kind of those areas that um that each most person is happy to focus on makes sense and i think we're kind of ready for all of these things if you give us a template or something we can quickly fill that out uh, we do have um you know the, the actual teams and team leaders and spokes, spokespeople uh, within those so we can structure that. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to be a problem to get headshots or at least, uh, you know, try to, to do those in, in the home environment. But um, I think we're well positioned in terms of all the resources and assets. We just need some structure from you to organize it properly. I think one of the things that comes to mind also, so Amy is just at the, the meeting right before this. We're just looking at some of the stuff around, like, basic brand and name and some of those some of those kind of pieces to see what those will be targeted at. So I think it seems like there's there's kind of two parallel tracks right now of sort of getting all of that stuff refined and figuring out exactly what that message is while we get all of the pieces together and ready um, for for that, that PR push that we're going to be doing. And then my hunch is we would we would merge those a, a little bit down the road before we do our, our sort of first major campaign, I guess. Yeah, so if you guys are working on branding, that's fantastic to know because you're right. There is a lot that can be done in tandem, and some of the work we do is supportive of what's happening on the branding side and vice versa. Some of the work that um, the branding side is doing is helpful for us. Um, so is that? it sounds like that's in the works right now. Is there a, a plan in action for when that's going to be created or finalized? Well, and this is Amy here. Uh, we just moments ago had our very first call about that <laughs> that I've been a part of. Um, so we did the big exploration in a micro form of the 
the why behind all of this, why people are excited about joining um, in this volunteer capacity, why the organization exists, why, um, what the impact ultimately in the world is ideally going to be. Um, I'm, so my brain is already sort of percolating on some things and I'll be going back with a few more questions. Um, my very first thought out of the gate is altruistic intelligence, um, people powering data for good. Um, so, you know, that's sort of my first stab at it. I'll come up with bunches of others, of course. Um, yeah. But just a little play on the AI. Yeah, I but love it. Not, I think it's fantastic. It's not artificial. It's people-based. Um, right. And, and the domain name is free, so <laughs> that's, oh, always that's, that's always nice. <laughs> um, so just when, I, when you say those two things, altruistic intelligence and people powering data for good, it makes me wonder, are you guys starting to think broader than just COVID? Or are you hyper-focused on COVID? Yeah, so we, we try to answer that, and uh, obviously there are layers to it. And um, yeah, I wish I could share my screen with you, but I'll send you this, uh, these four slides, which basically show the diagram of, you know, adding more and more layers on top of it. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll try to visualize it right now for, for you, and hopefully it makes sense. So the first one is, why are we here? So this is basically to respond to the CORD-19 Kaggle challenge and help medical professionals answer the questions. But that's not really why we're here. Kaggle brought us together, but we're really here to help the global fight against COVID-19. But I don't think we should stop there. We knew something like this would eventually happen, and we know something like this will happen again. So kind of tackling all the future outbreaks and emergencies. But why limit it to just outbreaks? If we plan ahead, we can make a permanent change to the medical and health community at large. So it becomes this kind of four four layer uh, circle. Does it okay. make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. That absolutely makes sense. And that's, that's good to know because that's really an important understanding to funnel the messaging because it isn't, I mean, it's COVID right now, but as you said, there's um, an impetus for it to go longer than that or farther than that. Um, I'm thinking what makes the most sense because again, I know how busy you guys are. I know that as volunteers, there's probably other things in your life besides this. Um, what we can do is share with you a list of questions that would fuel our key messages. And within that list of questions, there are also a lot of questions that I think are beneficial from a branding perspective. You can use them or not, but they're there. <laughs> and I think it helps you to just see all the different questions. Um, we don't use every single one from a from a um, key message, PR key message perspective, but I like to ask them all because I think, especially in the situation that you guys are in, where you're still trying to figure all this out and kind of solidify it, it might help to have some of those questions in front of you. So we can share a Google Doc and then that allows whoever wants to feed into it. Um, maybe we put a timeline on it for you to give us your feedback by a certain time. And then from there, we can create the key messages. Um, and those will be, our key messages are very much focused on press and, and third party perception. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's going to be, you know, so it's not necessarily key messages that we do on our site are not necessarily what a marketer would do or a brander would do because, because in that instance, you're focused on the brand and the company itself, where we're trying to focus on talking to the press or other influencer audiences, and we need to talk to a way that matters to them. Um, so that's the focus of key messages. But if we get these questions answered, and, and they don't have to be fancy, they can just be bullets, they can just be words, <laughs> they can be just, you know, streams of consciousness, but we can pull that together and use that to create um, really solid messaging for you. So yeah. does that sound like yeah, a good I, way to tackle it? Go ahead. I was just going to say, and if you could share the, um, I'm assuming the deck that you have tried to share with us on your screen with us, if you're happy to share that with us. Um, if there's any updates to it, then um, we can also utilize that. That sounds amazing. And yeah, as, as you mentioned, and, and like to give you a metaphor, we're kind of building an airplane while flying in it. So a lot of things are being solidified on the fly. 
and basically we're doing our best job to organize hundreds of people so like we're still figuring it out like the first week when i started getting these kind of requests for vision i was balancing between the fact that i have no clue and the, the fact that i still have to fulfill this as a vision to all the people that are expecting it so you know we're we're doing our best to do it on the fly obviously things are progressing very very fast and we kind of have this joke that we're measuring time in coronavirus years which is completely <laughs> different than you know a, a typical corporate or research institution time is and yeah we we can try our best to answer those so please share that with us okay fantastic i think that will be a nice way and it gives you know, everyone a chance to kind of weigh in equally. Um, and it's sometimes hard to do in this, you know, an instance where we get on a call, and, you know, especially in this particular environment where things are changing so much, I think this will just be a faster, more efficient way to do it. And the nice thing about messaging is even with very tried and true corporate environments, they often have to be updated every six to 12 months anyhow. So we recognize that while we may put together some messaging that works really well right now, it may need to shift over time and certainly that can be done. But we want to be able to go out with a great story as quickly as we can. And so that's why the messaging is so important. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like the, the messaging is going to be different for every, um, you know, press outlet. And we do understand that. Uh, for example, like the, um, you know, the Wall Street Journal uh, that we uh, got publication on is completely different from that three minute TV interview just because the audiences are different. There is a different uh, setting and different purpose. So maybe we can like also prioritize which audiences we want to hit and what type of outlets so we can better craft the, the positioning to that. Right. Right. Um. I'm just making a note here because you're you're spot on there with the audience that will be important like who is the audience and who do you want to reach and why and we talked about this a little bit on our call last week I know you know is it about um, recruitment that doesn't seem to be too big of an issue for you but are in you a way for, you, know, you know there's an imbalance okay. of you know professionals that we need in certain uh, mm -hmm. tasks uh, but yeah, I would say the biggest problem as of right now is adding an extra layer of uh, legitimacy for a fruitful <laughs> collaboration with the more mature infrastructures and organizations, such as other nonprofits, other organizations, such as you know hospitals. And um, like we had a call uh, yesterday with a Cleveland hospital that wants to use their data and build some form of predictive. Uh, analytics to help diagnostics and resource demand and other pieces and for you know organizations like that obviously first of all we have to have a legal framework to work with but second of all mm -hmm. we have to have some um, credibility and much clearer message why they they would be uh, interested to work with us mm -hmm. because we're essentially that launch pad for their ideas launch pad for exciting uh, rockets to launch into the space and we're able to provide them with resources, with people, and even fuel to, you know, catapult that rocket into the orbit and overcome mm -hmm. that, that gravity, the natural force of external world that prevents those exciting projects to, to come to fruition. And those would be a paid partnership relationships, right? I would assume. At uh, least so that they're paying for, I mean, I realize you're looking at a nonprofit status, but so that they're paying for the resources being very very good question as we we're uh, having discussions on how to establish this nonprofit entity we're also exploring ways to be sustainable in the long term so we are thinking about some models of rendering you know consulting rendering uh, paid services and simply making it a, a model that works All right well that makes sense and it wouldn't surprise me if there ends up being a few different models that get employed in different situations. So, you know, there might be, I, I could see, you know, the World Health Organization might have an initiative that is sufficiently compelling that we can easily get them to crowdsource the funds that are needed for it. There might be another one where, you know, if, if, no, if, if the, the White House might have a, you know, a specific, like, here's a piece that would be great to engage you with, where that might be a, a, a paid thing, or whatever that might be. One other thing that pops to mind, just on the on the kind of press kit side, um, I think because we have so 
has a wide global distribution of lots of people in different domains, the more we're able to come up with like easy templates that allow for some of our members to engage their local press. So that, you know, a, a quick kit that helps them say like, you know, essentially like, you know, local, local such and such joins global effort at, at AI combating COVID-19. Um, and the easier we make it for them to get those lower level press connections happening, that, that may be something that's effective for us. Yeah. And okay, yeah, that's good to know. <clears throat> yeah, I would, I would say that, you know, it's, it's kind of like it became easier for us to get press right now, but it's really about the focus and priorities right now because obviously there's so many publications that uh, may resonate to it, but it's also important to understand what kind of goals we want to hit and which audiences to attract. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be part of the questions that we include in that document because the other thing that you will find, or at least most likely we always find, is that everyone has slightly different ideas of what those goals are or should be. And so forcing it into an exercise where people have to think through it helps parse out um, and a little bit of debate over what makes the most sense. So those are really important questions to answer. Um, so we talked about key messages. We talked about what we need for spokespeople. Again, that'll be another document that we put together with some questions and some information that we need. Um, and I'm just going back here and looking. Um, the other question that we had going into this call was to get a sense for when there will be um, proactive news to share. So we know part of the message is just the, that, the, um, that this group exists, that this coalition has come together, whatever we're referring to it, collective, I mean, we've called it different things, but that's part, that's, that in and of itself is newsworthy and of interest and in what you're doing and why. The other part of it is what have you accomplished and what are you learning and what data are you putting out there or, you know, data have you discovered and been able to um, analyze and create certain, you know, pieces of knowledge from or whatever. So do you have a sense for a timeline of when those things will be available to share publicly? Yeah, so I think a good uh, point of reference is the first Kaggle challenge deadline, which is April 16th. And that's essentially when uh, all four teams that we're working with will produce first observable uh, result. And even though that result is not any kind of claims or you know uh, insights, that's something that we can take medical experts and community, integrate them into it, and essentially produce meaningful discussions and insights and basically let them connect the dots. So to give you an example, I just had a, a call today with this guy, Randall, who, who is a MD physician. Uh, he's al already retired, but he's uh, so credible, it's, it's insane. Like he worked with uh, uh, artificial intelligence lab, consulting them on a multitude of um, uh, projects. He was the one that participated in diabetes machine learning prediction that Google worked on. And he was also the coordinator of the SARS ge uh, geospatial analysis by, by the AI lab. And basically he is, he is that person that we can take, integrate into the results that we produce on April 16th and hopefully package that as a, as a you know, newsworthy material. And we have plenty of such people. Does it make sense? It does. I mean, obviously I have a few more questions about it, but, but what you said on the surface makes sense. And then there's, I would assume, some additional target dates following the 16th. Mm -hmm. So then there is a June uh, second submission, but I would actually say that we may have uh, consecutive amazing news stories and results as a, as a side effect, as a byproduct of us um, beginning to integrate all of these exciting ideas from different angles. So to give you an example, there is a team in our uh, community already that is working on fighting disinformation on COVID-19. And they're not really creating, you know, something that analyzes the COVID-19 data set. They're creating an extension that is able to recognize medical claims and identify if they're false. 
So, you know, such things could also become newsworthy um, babies that we would produce out of our community. Yeah, exactly. I think that's very accurate. Um, and that's interesting, yeah, that these side things will, are coming about in tandem. What, one other thing that we're doing is we're just starting to have, so we've had a couple of webinars that have happened kind of about what we're doing. Um, or, or another one that happened just generally about COVID-19. Those are things that could be worth publicizing. One of the things we have coming up on the 15th, there's a, there's a professor who's kind of world famous for his work with smart cities and cities that deal with data for encouraging their populations to act in, in useful ways. Um, and we're, we're looking at potentially teaming up with tra um, transformational technology labs and TEDx um, to be hosting a talk with him. Um, so the, the talk would be focused on Corona Y and how his work relates to what we're doing. Uh, and it'll be like an hour long Zoom conversation that other people can join. So we're going to try to publicize that. But my hunch is that there will be more opportunities, things like that moving forward, getting interesting people whose expertise is relevant to what we're doing and having public discourse mm -hmm. town, town hall meetings with them. With That's the webinar, <laughs> yeah, um, with the webinar on the 15th, so that's uh, next week. If you can share with us the, the details and locations and any kind of background you have on it after this call, then we can take a look at the details and essentially see if there's any press that we could invite to watch um, the webinar. Is it live or is it going to be so pre recorded? It's, it's going to be like a static submission. Uh, we were not planning on doing webinar, but now that you say it, it makes 100% sense. And I think we should do a webinar and kind of expose and explain the results in a more digestible manner because they will be quite technical and, you know, there will be a lot of, um, you know, tech uh, stuff surrounding it. So our goal is to simplify it and deliver it to, you know, people that are, are interested in learning more about it. So let's, let's agree on that webinar, whatever time you think works uh, in terms yeah, of okay. zones and uh, we can already. So, for, forgive me, I apologize. I must have misheard. What, what's happening on April the 15th? Right, so on the 15th, oh, oh, go, go ahead. On the, on the 15th, it's going to be probably it'll be a Zoom call. That's going to be a mixture of people from. Right, I've got you, okay. Yeah. Apologies, I thought I thought I had webinar, but I'm glad that I'm sending but now it, a webinar it makes idea. Sense. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but, but we are looking at how we can turn that into something where both a bunch of people can participate and then we'll have the recording of that be something that mm -hmm. we put out as well. Yeah, because well, that's actually something go ahead. that was something that Nasty and I were um we were discussing about um potentially presenting kind of an official launch. Um where we can provide you know those milestone data or you know find that news hook that we were just talking about and perhaps the webinar can be quite timely to uh, accommodate and and um amplify that news um but we'd want to make sure that we do it you know together strategically um so that we can make the announcement and then we can kind of tag in the webinar um around that um uh, but i think you know if we can have a bit more time on that um, that will help us kind of get our thoughts together and, and a, a strategy together. That's that was great. On that. yeah, yeah, I just did have one question. So the Zoom call, mm. the way that it, is that going to be um, internal? Like, it's, because mm. what we can do is if we have control over timing and we could, if whatever's happening on the Zoom call, but we could push out the announcement of that by a little bit and give us a little bit more time. That would be nice if there's a reason that it that it would need to happen sooner then we deal with it um, but if the zoom call is just kind of internally um, and nope it doesn't have to be out publicly then we can maybe push out um, the webinar till maybe the following week or something you know just to give us a little bit more time mm -hmm. to put it in front of press we can do that okay. i think it's actually a good idea because i mean nothing goes perfectly on the day when, when it has to and we're, we're working with crazy deadlines here. It's going to be a very crazy uh, weekend. Um, but yeah, let's, if you tell us we need to push it one, one more week, we can do it. Um, let's, let's figure out what's the best timing. Okay, great. Yeah, that would be, 
helpful. And then like Lizzie said, any information you have on it, including participants and anything else, um, then then we get a better sense of, of what the news is. Yeah, we're gonna create a, <laughs> so like we, we're fully flexible. Uh, we'll probably have to uh, spend, you know, a couple of days ideating the ideal structure and kind of the flow. Um, but also let us know, like just from the high level, do you think those are gonna be reporters interested in like seeing if this is real and then kind of writing a story after it or? Yes, um, I do think that there will be some interest in this. The, the biggest thing that we'll need to do, and, and you've already started this, which is wonderful, and um, then we want to continue it, is just establishing that credibility, right? This isn't just some random group of people, right? These are yeah. um, credible, um, credentialed individuals who've come together from all over. So we just really want to be able to package it up in that best foot forward sort of way so that it's clear that mm -hmm. what not only that this group of people is credible, but also what is being accomplished and why and how and what is the purpose. And then I absolutely think that over time, and we're not talking tons and tons of time, but over time, we'll start to build relationships with press where they will start to look for what is Corona Y saying right now? What are they, what's happening with them right now? What are they saying about this news angle? You know, and the other thing that we had talked about briefly is while all of this is going on and, um, and you know you're you're working on your deadlines and everything else and lizzie brought this up slightly when she was talking about spokespeople um if we have a sense for what topics you guys are very comfortable speaking on or having an opinion about that um we're seeing coming up in the news then we want to put you forward as just a resource on that topic it's not necessarily directly about what you're doing but we're putting you forward as thought leader because you understand it because you have exposure to so much data because of what you're seeing or the people that you're talking to um, so that's another way to keep getting that. So that's our goal and our purpose would be to continue to build these relationships so that not only are press aware of who you are, but that we start hopefully getting press coming to us <laughs> and saying, hey, what's happening right now? What are you guys working on? What do you think of this? You know, can I talk to somebody mm -hmm. who can talk yeah. to me about this? And, you know, I already started getting these incoming uh, things. You know, I yeah. almost made a mistake and almost gave an interview to dailycaller.com, which is the one founded by Tucker Carlson or something which is like extremely far right publicly. yeah <laughs> and I like guys simply saved me from it and like because I, I had no clue so <laughs> yeah. well so on that on. and actually that was oh sorry we're going to say the same thing Lizzie, go ahead. yeah <laughs> I was just going to say it was actually a point I was going to bring up um given having seen the coverage that you've got to date which is great I think if we're going to go down this more strategic road now you know packaging up the news announcement and making sure the messaging's right any kind of inbound request that you get if you're happy to please do share with us and Natalie and I can manage those um manage that for you just forward it on to us and we can take the kind of communications um and on your behalf of course um and that way we can essentially protect you slightly and we can control the messaging a bit more um, and find out more if, you know what we can do is find out more detail about the stories that they're writing what they're looking for and then we can kind of cultivate that data or talking points as and when um you know depending on what the request is um, you know, sometimes these lovely journalists like to catch us off guard. Um, so if you just forward it straight on to us, we can manage that for you. Amazing. So we'll Amazing. Do that. Yeah. Well, yeah, we can also, you okay, know, you will get to a place where not everything is worth your time. Mm -hmm. And we want to be able to look at them and assess, like, is this worthwhile right now? Or is this just not really meeting the goals that we already decided that we want to reach? So please do. Yeah, I actually, Lizzie was really nice and I'm way more forceful about it. <laughs> but please, please, please send us please funnel everything our way. It just, it's really chaotic and very problematic if multiple press things or, or anything are going, you know, through different channels. It's really hard for us. And it also makes us look really um, unprofessional when we're talking to the press and they're like, wait a minute, I already talked to so-and-so or somebody else already talked to me, you know. So yeah. if we can just keep all that funneled in one channel, it will make it a lot easier. All right. Yeah, um, and it might be worth on our end, what we can do, and we do this for all our clients, is that we set up a... Um, media alias essentially so mm -hmm. you know we can call it Brenna White from PR.com or whatever it might be and what you can do with the members is maybe just send out a, a kind of wide email and just say any press inquiries please forward on to this email address and so Nasty and I will both get it so either one of us will pick it up so you know things Done. Aren't, aren't dropped um, 
so that might be worth doing it just so there's no you know just so everyone's got the message <laughs> no, like it it sounds great thank you so much for offering that because that alone will free up so much of our time you can't imagine like it's it's very consuming when it comes to managing other things so yeah and it's also important to say that there are certain aspects of our collaboration and community that are very you know easy easily like it could be taken to polarize and you know we, we attract people with shared beliefs about you know that we're entering this new world where things will be different you know, there are conversations about post-capitalism, different kind of capitalism, the one that is conscious, the one that is really about humans versus financial system. And, you know, even though we enjoy talking about these things, uh, I don't think we're ready to speak about those, uh, you know, as, you know, it, when it comes to press or like being political about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that would be very critical to to determine right because you're right especially being a global organization you you want to stay clear probably of politics as much as possible just for that reason you'll find yourself in a slippery slope really really fast um, and, and especially because what we're trying to do is be able to engage so that policymakers can use the information that we're coming up with yeah we have we have to, to really have, have a, a strong line on that to, to seem as an impartial think tank and provider of findings and data rather than with any kind of a political slant to what we're doing. Exactly. That would be our goal, too. So I agree with you. I think that's really, really important. Um, so, yep. Neutral. <laughs> um, okay. And it also obviously makes you credible from data scientist's perspective anyhow. So, um, um, all right. Well, I think I, just as we talked, you know, we're taking notes over here, I feel like there's several things that we want to get underway in terms of information and material um, once we get this stuff done you know our goal is always to get all the information that we need and can so that we can take off all the workload that we can off of you so that we're not having to keep coming to you and bugging you and trying to figure what is that we'll get to a place give us a few weeks we'll get to a place where we have a pretty good understanding of what you need to do and how we can help you um, when the meantime we'll be looking obviously for press opportunities as well but we really want to get a sense for some of these questions, key messages, some of the things that are coming up in the news pipeline, and then some of the background on who the spokespeople are. From there, we can really hit the ground running. And then, of course, right away, we're still handling any um, reactive uh, queries that come your way. Um, give us those and we'll manage them. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, is there, do you guys have any questions? Um, Lizzie, do you also have anything that we haven't talked about yet? I have to quickly, I'm going to step out just because our boys are getting a little restless, but uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you, guys. No worries. to meet you. Lovely um, to meet you. But yeah, I mean, everything sounds uh, super clear. I think uh, you've, you gave us already plenty of ideas in terms of how to take this to the next level. I'm already thinking about how to package that you know, event uh, after submission in terms of like creating a web page with all these super credible people that are working on this right now to just showcase the immense power, intellectual power, and you know, the potential outcomes of this. So yeah, we just uh, need to take a breath, uh, take your checklist and ideate the best possible uh, way to, to communicate. Okay. Perfect. That sounds great. And in the meantime, we'll work on those documents that we can share, like I said, we'll share them in Google Doc form so that people can feed into them. Perfect. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Awesome. Like you, really excited. Thanks, yeah. Elsa. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. We look forward to working together, Arturo, and hopefully we can um, be of good help to you guys. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Have a good weekend. Bye. You Take too. Care. Bye. 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 Hey, Amy. You still here? Yeah, I'm still here. I'll, um, I just wanted to say at the end here, I'll uh, play with a bunch of different things that are bubbling up for me and uh, sort of throw some things at you and at Daniel and Anton as well and um, see what resonates with you first mm -hmm. and we'll sort of find our way through that. And uh, I've got some ideas coming so <laughs> hopefully we'll get you some good things in the next couple of days
Perfect. And I hope that call was also beneficial for you to, you know, kind of understand yeah. the, the scope. Yeah. No, it's it. great to know what they're doing, what they're sort of needing in the sort of near future. And um, hopefully we can help get this uh, messaging of the brand in line in order for them to use that going forward. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, again, yeah, like you. thank you. And great to meet you at last. <laughs> true, true. All right. Thank you. All uh, right. We'll have a good day. You too. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.